Well, having achieved a bit of social engineering, uh, my father was in the furniture removal business. There is a chair for John Suffolk. Uh, this is all far too comfortable, John. Um, do take a seat. Um, uh, can I congratulate our speakers on keeping in a disciplined way to the time? So I'm going to abrogate the, uh, uh, the position of the chair to disrupt this uh, uh, false harmony that's come out so far. It's far too comfortable um, because the point is evolution is a really good idea, um, as we may have spotted over several centuries, uh, but evolution in this area won't work without functional governance. Uh, we've been told that we shouldn't tolerate failure. Uh, of uh, projects. We've been told that it's not about technology and engineering, it's about people and organisations. Uh, well, it's about industry too, and uh, over the last 30 years, the building industry uh, has changed quite dramatically in its capacity to deliver. I don't see why the IT industry shouldn't be expected to do so too. Uh, and what strikes me is that as a minister, uh, I was telling Home Office officials exactly what Jim said in his two uh, recommendation slides uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. I underline that. I was telling officials, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, because I'd say to Ross, it's not ministers who shy away from decisions. Actually, ministers are the people who look to the long term. If it's left to officials, uh, you wouldn't have had the reduction in carbon emissions over the last half century. Um, it's officials who've been fighting doctors for 61 years, and it's Whitehall that doesn't understand <laughs> governance. So, um, how do you obey two of Ross's golden rules? Leadership by a chief executive, leadership by the board, absolutely uh, right. Uh, sorry, uh, Jim's golden rules, I beg your pardon. Government departments don't have a chief executive officer, they don't have a CEO, and they don't have a board in any real sense, and they don't really communicate very well with ministers. Uh, so you have totally dysfunctional governance in Whitehall, and if you leave that out of the picture, um, you make impossible the job of anybody who's brought in to try and sort it out. <laughs> he is expected to walk on water, because the governance hasn't been changed. Because nobody's responsible in my talk, and only ministers are willing to look to the long term. Uh, the, the, the message I would bring you is that of the prisoner's chorus in Fidelio. It was the minister who arrived, freed the prisoners, and is the good guy. Right. <laughs> now, I just thought somebody ought to yeah, read this. <laughs> uh, at this point, we're, we're open for discussion. Can I perhaps, uh, John, ask you from your experience in uh, Whitehall as well as your industry experience, uh, your comment on what you've heard from our three speakers, and then I'll throw it open to the floor. Um, thank you, Alan. Um, I, I was talking to Jim before we, we kicked the session off. I said, this is not going to be my first training session again, is it? And the answer was, 31 years ago when I went on my first training, we were talking about the same issues. And that says to me one of a number of things. It's either we're not listening, that's we, the collective we, we're trying to uh, address the wrong problem, or we're just completely rubbish. And my belief is, you know, listening to all the debates from lots of people in the field, I think we're fundamentally addressing the wrong problem. You know, we have heard time and time again that this is not a techie thing, it's a leadership issue, it's a business issue. And yet I very rarely hear people talking when an IT project fails, and I don't buy the IT project concept, we didn't achieve this business benefit, we didn't achieve this policy outcome, we didn't improve education, we didn't reduce X, Y and Z. And that to me is a leadership issue, because something somewhere has fundamentally failed to happen. Um, so I think in essence we have to move our debate up the value chain to business leaders. How do they fundamentally drive the success of their business, of which IT is one component of that? I have seen no research anywhere in the world which says IT is the linchpin. It's the people, it's the process, it's the innovation, it's the culture. And yet, even on the slides, we talk about information systems, we talk about technology. <coughs> we don't talk about creating business value from the investment that we make. So for me, I think that we have to shift the debate which says, when we talk of failure, we talk about a business has not either reduced its cost or has not improved from an outcome or an output perspective, and where is the accountability for that? Um, we didn't talk a great deal about capability. And um, as I'm getting old now, 
I can see the cycle coming back round. You know, Ross talked about branch banking systems. Well, I put the first real-time branch banking system in in the UK in 1981, and we did it in nine months. And the problems that we are trying to address today are actually the same problems that we addressed 20, 30 years ago. But the education system, the suppliers, have lost some of that experience. We think all this new techie stuff is new and exciting. It's just a different label on an old way of doing business. Yes, we can do more. Yes, we can do it faster. And yes, we can do it anywhere in the world. But actually, the problems that we are solving, generally speaking, are the same problems. It's not a technical issue. It's a capability issue. It's a competence issue. It's an understanding, how the hell do you run a good business? And running a good business is running good business change. Because any of you are you know, chief execs in this room or um, uh, senior officials, I'd say, do you go to your job to manage the status quo? Is that what success looks like? Are you measured on achieving absolutely nothing year on year? How many people do you think say yes to that question? Absolutely no. Therefore, there must be change. And as everybody on the panel has said, change is the hardest thing that we can do. Because every one of us in this room will block change if we don't think we like it, or will support change if we think it's good for us. And that's where the difficulty comes in. We should open up to the floor. Thank you very much indeed. What I'm going to do is to ask people to uh, ask their questions briefly and succinctly. Uh, I'll take a brief comment as being uh, uh, asking for a, a response. So I'll take it as really being a question, uh, but I won't tolerate long contributions. We'll take as many as we can, and then I'll turn to the panel to, uh, to go through the panel to sum up, rather than answering individual questions. Is everybody happy with that? Okay, good. We have mics at either side. We have mics at either side, so you... you sorry? Yes. Um, w when uh, I invite you to ask your question, uh, would you say who you are uh, with some indication uh, of uh, where you come from or what the hell you're here for? <laughs> First, please. Uh, lady here and a gentleman there. Well, hello. Uh, Jennifer Stapleton. Um, uh, I introduce myself as the architect of one of the sticking plasters that Martin referred to, uh, the dynamic systems development method, which has been going since 94. Now, that's not really what my bandwagon, what I'm uh, worried about is two things. There is a discontinuity between what Martin was saying and what Ross was saying, in that Martin would like to have and, and Jim as well, actually, wanted basically to build a, build a system, you know, have a system architect who knows what they're doing, gets the specification absolutely right, then get somebody to build it and then d deliver it and, oh, it's not what you wanted, which is the constant problem. Whereas over on Ross's side, the, the side I agree with, we have that we build incrementally. And we, we take a partial solution, we build on that and we take that forward. It's not putting aside the, 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 the issues or the problems. We're knowing the problems we need to address, but we, we, we start with less. That's my question. Yeah. Do the two fit together? You've sp spotted the interesting challenge that the uh, audience has to reconcile these two things. Uh, now, is the technology um, working? Um, I think so. Uh, Bashar Nusebi from the Open University. I'm from a computing department. Um, so I, I guess it's, 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 it's very related, which is um, to, to the initial question, which is there is a tension, it seems, for our desire to have systems that are stable, that don't break, that last for a long time, when in fact we have volatility in our requirements and our stakeholder needs, and we regard change as something that is inevitable and that, that we want to be able to support, yet at the same time building technology that is stable and that is going to last and doesn't have to change every, every two or three years. So I think we have some interesting, difficult questions that we have to deal with in terms of stability versus volatility. Thank you very much. Henry Cornerbring, Reuters Institute, University Sorry, of Oxford. Can I just say wave if you're otherwise, uh, if you're too shy, I won't notice that you want to ask a question. And a uh, question specifically for Ross, why ministers and projects don't mix? Uh, you mentioned a couple of things that ministers have to take into account, power struggles, electoral issues, security. Uh, aren't there also things that might be considered legitimate things for ministers to take into account? Things like uh, we generally think are central to democracy, like transparency and accountability. How feasible is it really to ask someone to stay away for two years, considering that transparency and accountability is also important? Thank you very much. Professor Thomas, you mentioned um, the role of the architect, the systems architect. And I'd like the whole panel's views on uh, the 
professionalization of the IT industry, the difference is, you know, how do you know the IT equivalent of a professional architect? What are the uh, potentials and qualifications that people have to look for? And also, is there anything that the IT industry can learn from other industries that manage successful complex projects, such as building industry? Thank you very much. Would you pass two to your left and then to the gentleman in front? Um, David Evans from the British Computer Society. Uh, very uh, simple question, I guess. Um, if you're a senior, senior responsible owner on a public sector project that fails, um, what impact does this have on your career? Yeah. You, get, you get promoted, that's the easy one. <laughs> um, Mark Smith, head of IT at Monitor, um, and previously in the NHS for 20 odd years. Um, I think my question is, I've, 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 I keep saying to people, the IT is simple in many ways, but you really have to know what you want. How do we educate the boards and the people who, who, who want the systems so that they can define what they need? Because that is the biggest problem. Thank you very much. Charles Chang, independent consultant. Uh, I think Professor Ross Anderson's comment on 30% failure in the 60s and 30% failure nowadays in the corporate sector anyway, might lead one to believe that uh, perhaps, like the speed of light, 30% is a constant. Um, <laughs> we, we, if, if that is so, then perhaps the real reason why we have this figure is human endeavor is always striving for the next possible thing. So as we improve in capability, either human or technology, we're always aiming for the next best thing. So we're always going to hit 30% failure. If we didn't, then we're not shooting high enough. Yes, Icarus had 100% failure. Saab <laughs> Zembi, uh, independent. Just a question on some of the tools that we have around. Uh, and I know in, in the UK we've been pushing prints for a long time. Is it that the tools that we're using, like prints, not any good anymore for the sort of projects we're working on? Do we need to change prints? Or is it that the tools that we're using are not being used effectively enough? Thank you. Gentleman there. Uh, Conrad Taylor. <clears throat> Would it be possible to ask for From. a ban? Sorry? From? Um, I'm a member of the British Computer Society, but I'm here as an individual. Um, would it be possible to ask for a ban on the use of the term information technology? It seems to me that what we're looking at is designing information and data management systems, and those information systems also include human systems, and the technology is just a component on it. I think that the, the use of the word of the term IT has fixated people on the technology. Thank you. Lady behind. Fleur Fisher, a primary healthcare specialist group of the British Computer Society. Uh, one of the, the problems, I think, with um, IT and government is very often the subject, the data subject, is an individual. And especially, is that very obviously so in, in healthcare, where I've called um, the identifiable patient record the virtual naked patient. And uh, I think it's that the uh, virtual naked individual that's often uh, involved in I IT. I can't see where that we now have effective involvement of the public who, uh, who are knowledgeable and care about these things in the system specification. We are presented with them as a de facto. Thank you. Uh, Peter Tobb is an IT manager and formerly in the health service. Uh, I'd like to ask Ross Anderson, in 1997, I think there was an attempt to um, decentralise the planning of uh, information management in the health service. Um, can you tell us something about why that didn't happen? Uh, Anthony Meehan, um, The Open University. I, I want to be a little provocative, um, uh, a little. For, particularly for the first two contributions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to stand up so that people can see my waistline. There's a constant battle going on. And everyone tells me that I need to eat less and exercise more. And that is always repeated every time I try and confront them with my struggle. And with respect, gentlemen, that's what I heard from yourselves. You haven't got the message yet, and so we're just going to say it a bit louder. I thought uh, Professor Anderson was beginning to grapple with some of the issues that, that, that people who are, who are looking at, at the problems of tackling uh, waistlines have been looking at. They're looking at, 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 at a complex system and some of the factors that can be worked at. But even Professor Anderson didn't go as far enough for me. The central, the central thing that we haven't mentioned today is public value. 
we've talked about the purpose of these systems that we're trying to develop, but even Ross Anderson got as far as the purpose is to stop or is to tax cars coming into London, not to reduce uh, congestion, not to reduce pollution, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that a lot of our problems are to do with the fact that the real purpose of public sector information systems isn't explicitly stated, understood, and worked towards. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just tempted to say that it, uh, I apply this to myself as much as you. It's obvious some of us aren't listening, and that is part of the problem. Sorry. Uh, Charles Simons, independent consultant. Uh, there is a foreign government that has claimed, that has published a process that claims that it has resulted in getting an improvement of a factor of three over the last 10 to 15 years in price performance of the software it buys, and that its systems are now delivered to time and budget in spite of changes that have to be managed or costs. Can anyone on the panel name that government? A democracy, I should have said. <laughs> yeah, isn't it time um, government gave up its fixation with outsourcing and started developing its own internal capacity? Thank you. Uh, Richard Sarson, freelance journalist and member of the Parliamentary IT Committee. Um, I've been 54 years of in this industry, and for 50 years I've heard talks like Jim's and Martin's. In fact, I've heard that talk from them, I think, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> the big question is, why don't people learn? Why do people go through Gershon red lights the whole time, etc.? Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, try and be concise because you're running short of time. The conversation has been centred around risk a lot. And one of the things that um, depresses me when we hear thing, people talk about risk, although it was mentioned that the role of business people is to take risks, in IT systems we still time to see risk as something that has to be eliminated rather than something that maybe at specification time can be analysed and costed for example, if you're trying to develop it, I mean, I was horrified by the thought of expecting my users to go away and sit in a dark room for two years while I develop them a system. Business moves on faster than that, and business change is one of the risks. Richard Feynman used to say, said in his Challenger report that for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over political necessity, for nature cannot be fooled. And maybe that's the fundamental, that we have to learn to recognise what the risks are factor them in and cost them and learn how to deal with them rather than trying to rationalise them away through political necessity. Thank you. I'm Rod Dowler. I run a, a London search engine. I kind of Google for property. <coughs> the point is I spent about 30 years <laughs> developing um, traditional systems um, and I know that you had to get them right because they cost so much. What I notice now <coughs> is that people coming into the industry are very much more able. They've kind of grown up with computers. They build things quickly. The mics for they build into. things very quickly <laughs> and they build things very cheaply. Therefore, it completely changes the economics. It's much more sensible <clears throat> to build something, try it, see if it's what you want, and then change it. And that's, I think, the key to evolutionary software. And I think that's different from what some people say. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Robin Wilton. Um, I work for Sun Microsystems on digital identity. I'd, I'd just like to make an observation for the, see if the panel have comments about something that I think has changed in the characteristics of IT systems. Um, those, those banking systems that we were talking about 20 years ago achieved tremendous functional change, but they did very little in terms of social change, other than perhaps to boot people out of bank branches to, the, to queue at the ATMs. <coughs> These days it seems to be increasingly easy to specify and deliver IT projects that have the potential to produce enormous social change as well as functional change. And perhaps that's a basic ground rule that has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years. Thank you very much. And the final contribution. Tom Steinberg from My Society. Who should decide what is made next? A good point to end the contributions and start with the responses. 1997 decentralisation fell. Um, well, 1995, um, 96, I was doing stuff with the BMA. We persuaded the previous government not to centralise everything. We then put some effort into briefing new Labour while it was still in opposition. Uh, the good effects of this lasted for one parliament. Then the Secretary of State changed, and he wasn't someone that we'd been able to get at. Um, if you want a short answer on that. Uh, somebody else asked about whether we should build internal capacity. Yes, uh, I'm all in favour of this. 
Um, the sort of thing we were doing in banking 20 years ago was making a rule that you didn't make the break through the glass ceiling to senior manager until you had IT project experience. Whether it was working as a user in a new treasury system or running the PC helpline, we didn't care. You didn't get to manage managers until you had done IT. Uh, now, uh, were I prime minister for a day, one of the things I would do would be to make a rule saying you don't make uh, grade three in the civil service until you've done IT. No exceptions. Even if you're the only diplomat who speaks Korean and we need an ambassador to Korea, tough. You go to programming school, then you get to be ambassador to Korea. And finally, to the substantive points that people were making, um, like who should decide um, what to make next? And what sort of time scale should we look at innovation for and who does it? I think these all come together with finding ways in which you can manage um, evolution in an incentive compatible way. There are one or two other examples of evolution being managed in the public sector. The budget's a good example. The chancellor gets up, puts a penny and fags and tuppence some whiskey and so on. These are incremental changes to a complex socio-technical system. Why does it sort of work? Well, the chancellor's usually in post for a few years, and so he's got some reasonable expectation that he'll be held to account next time round for what he did last time round. Where you're doing changes that will take effect and which will be judged, within someone's tenure of office, whether a minister or a senior civil servant, you've got a reasonable hope of progress. Um, what tools can you bring to assess that? Well, one of the things we've done in dependability economics is looking at the software patching cycle. Um, now, different principals would like patches to be rolled out more frequently than once a month or less frequently than once a month. There's a fair amount of analysis about this and how these uh, things trade off and how you get to a happy medium. Something like that, I think, is going to be needed um, in the public sector. But one thing that you're, you're not going to make work is where a prime minister stands up and says, we're going to fix the NHS with a 10-year project, and it's my successor's problem if it doesn't work. That just hits all the wrong buttons. You've got to get the innovation done by the people who will be able to use and to judge the change. And in the, the, the case I mentioned, for example, of GP systems, it's got to be GPs that drive that. Because if you've got a, 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 a test system uh, that's designed by Sir Humphrey, it will be brilliant at delivering test results to Sir Humphrey's desk. But you want the test results delivered to your GP's desk, not to Sir Humphrey's desk. And some basic rules like that applied to the public sector could, I think, bring about a really radical improvement in how things are done. Thank you very much. Martin? I, I was asked, what, why haven't people listened? And I, I think the simple answer to that is Moore's Law. Yes. I think that really ever, ever since the invention of the transistor and maybe before, um, people have been focusing on picking the low-hanging fruit. They've been using the fact that computing is getting ever more powerful and ever cheaper to move into new application areas and to therefore uh, offer functionality that wasn't available to business before. And for that reason, functionality has always taken precedence over dependability. You've always been able, as a supplier, to make more money out of coming up with a new application than you could out of coming up with an application that worked better. And that, that really is a symptom of the immaturity of the industry. There's now a large part of the IT industry that is servicing what are essentially mature applications. And we need to recognise that you need different strategies for different sorts of problems. And that leads into the, the second key question, I think, that, that I was asked, which is about the uh, apparent um, con conflict between incremental development and, and the places where that is very successful and the need to keep up with rapid business changes and genuine changes in requirements and what I was arguing for, which is doing a specification that actually makes sure you really do understand what it is you're trying to achieve. That conflict exists actually in the underlying business problem. The sort of strategy that is appropriate for a web-based property search engine, where you can afford to keep getting it wrong because you will also be able to keep getting it better is not the sort of strategy that would work for the electronic patient record where once you've actually uh, revealed the personal details of a large number of people with HIV to the general public 
you've actually done something. You need to take a different approach depending on what the, the <coughs> particular issue is. And a lot of IT these days is building part of, of what, what is being increasingly called the critical national infrastructure. And we need to use mature, strong engineering approaches to get those things right. It's not acceptable that we should be writing software in a language like C, which is, is not properly defined, where every time you recompile the program, it is entirely legitimate for its meaning to change, where it's very, very easy for, for programmers to make trivial mistakes and very hard for them to find them, with the Thank result you. that a, 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 an operating system like, like Microsoft XP has literally tens of thousands of security vulnerabilities in it, many of which were patched in Vista. But who's running Vista these days compared with the number of people running earlier versions of the operating system? Thank Those you, are the kind of problems that come out of not doing the engineering right. Jim. Ch Chairman, I'll be very quick. I think I can draw a couple of threads together. And that is, yes, I would ban the use of the term IT. In particular, I'd ban it in the Treasury's Green Book in Procurement Guidance, which says you can have an IT project. Furthermore, I'd ban it in the OGC so that the OGC gateway structures, which are good, are applied to the totality of the business change and not the IT. If you have not got a budget for the business change, you have not got a project. Don't pass gateway zero. Don't, don't collect 200 pounds. One more very quick one. We have forgotten our history. I commend to anyone in this room a wonderful book called A Computer Called Leo. And in A Computer Called Leo, they pointed out the very first code, which was jolly hard to write because it was written essentially in machine code, came out right first time because the people who built it came out of organization and methods and they spent many, many happy hours flowcharting it in great detail before they would let anywhere near code. And we spent 50 years forgetting about that. <coughs> then finally, Richard, I wish I could stop giving that speech because I find it boring <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just a few points. Uh, yeah. We talk about five things. First, first of all, on my list is leadership. There is no substitute for good leadership. There is no substitute for being clear what success yeah, yeah. looks like which is the balance between risk and reward. And like some of the speakers, waiting two years for a solution, I'd be fired in past lives if I said it would take me two years. That doesn't mean, in essence, that we give the people all the requirements. Um, there is no substitute for accountability. If success doesn't matter and failure doesn't matter, then in essence we are committing ourselves, ourselves to mediocrity forever. That is a leadership issue, it is not a technology issue. I do not believe it is acceptable for a senior business person to say, I do not understand this techie IT kind of thing. That to me is tantamount to saying, I can't read and write in this day and age. And the more and more we begin to say, well, given that every successful economy in the world, every successful business in the world is underpinned by the strategic use of technology, to allow people to say that I think is fundamentally outrageous. Secondly, there is no substitute for capability. <coughs> You can go on as many courses as you want, unless you carry the scars of getting it wrong time and time again, there is no inherent learning. Someone talked on Moore's Law. I think the rate of change in our industry has never been so fast and it's accelerating. But with that comes the challenge of re-equipping ourselves as individuals with our capability and the people who supply us and the organisations have to make things happen. I don't think we've worked out how we, we cope in a world that's changing on a quarterly basis, never mind on a several year basis. I absolutely buy what people said here, don't reinvent the wheel. My message always has been steal with pride. You know, <laughs> if someone has been there and got the scars and fixed the issues, copy, 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 copy. And that's exactly what we're doing from a public sector perspective. You know, break down the silos, use what's there. Change is a team sport. Yes. It is not a vertical activity. And a team for me is ministers, it's officials, it's suppliers, it's citizens. And if it is a team sport, you're only as strong as the team. You can have the greatest prima donnas in the world, as we have seen from a sporting analogy, doesn't mean they can deliver on the field. So we have to promote this team sport. And I have to say, my starting position is no one sets out to fail. And therefore, that's about saying to people, if we fail, we should learn the lessons at an individual perspective as well as at a corporate level. And finally, do not underestimate the rate of change. Someone touched over here which says, I think Tom touched on it, 
the education system, the people coming through will look at what we do in business today and say, over my dead body will I join an organisation like that. I want to work how I work, when I work, where I want to work, not in this rigid world. And I don't think we have spotted that subtle paradigm shift going on here which will stress all economies and all businesses around the world. Thank you very much indeed. Um, some things change quickly, other things don't change at all. Uh, I just offer three reflections on this uh, session and the panel responses. Uh, firstly, um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Uh, and uh, uh, some of you have spotted that both Emily and I posed the question, what can we learn from development, develops, sorry, developments in other industries? What's this space? I suggest it may be an interesting area uh, for discussion within the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, in the coming months. Um, secondly, uh, the IT industry is a youngster. Um, as a youth worker and trainer, I used to point out that the comments of today's adults about the youth of today uh, were, put, were put by Plato into the mouth of Socrates in the Platonic Dialogues. Um, it's, a, it's the economy, stupid. Perhaps in this context ought to re be replaced. It's the people, stupid. And I do suggest that governance in Whitehall actually is one of the biggest obstacles to learning some of the lessons we've talked about. Finally, don't knock the capacity of politicians to change things. Reducing car emissions was a policy introduced by politicians as a result of the great smog of London. Uh, and if you look at it, it took about 50 years to reach the point we've got to now, and the journey isn't finished. It's been delivered by ministers and industry in Whitehall over 50 years. So some, some things, uh, some changes, can be delivered over time. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on your behalf, I'd like to thank Alan, uh, and I knew he'd, uh, as I've seen him perform previously, uh, chair in such an authoritative and effective way. And um, so thank you very much for your help, Alan.